when you're at the office. <laughs> <laughs> you're just waiting for a certain deal to come, Emma to come with different ideas and different uh, suggestions. And then in your wise mind, you see, okay, this is a good suggestion. Yeah. I can go with this. That's how you're going to survive. Yeah. But otherwise, instead of you coming to maybe a coffee shop and you see paper all over your coffee shop, you're like, okay, business is booming. Business is booming. Yeah. At the end of it all, after three months of opening up or five months, people will be nowhere. Maybe because coffee is bad. Maybe because the surface is bad. Maybe because the infrastructure yeah. is bad. So all such things have to be put into consideration. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, our time is fast spent. Mm. I know that we can talk, yeah, you know. know. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk, you know, forever about coffee. Yeah. But thank you for coming on to the show. And mm. um, just before we leave, okay, mm. what are your next plans when you get out of here? I know it's a weekend, oh. you know. <laughs> you have, are you going back to the coffee shop? No, Pro no, no, no. Probably you have a death. You know, but <laughs> see you looking all fresh, you know. <laughs> no, I'm just going to have um, a GNN chat because I have someone to host. Yeah. Uh, 2 p.m. So, yeah, I'll be hosting him, shoot an interview with him. Okay. Yeah. Then that I'll go and watch a football match. Mm. Man United. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, man, you support. Uh, man, you support. Now these days we have the best coach around. Well, yeah. we'll, we'll end that show, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So come on, this is come but, on, but it's, it's good. It's good that um, uh, I'm back on the show. Yeah. I've been missing these conversations. Uh, I know we've been trying to get in touch and have this conversation. Yeah. Much. It's good that we've had it and um yeah yeah it's good well i'd like to say welcome back thank you it's good <laughs> to have you back <laughs> for those of you who have been uh, thinking of where the messiah is well he's back mm. and it's a good thing that he has come back to the show maybe next weekend he'll be the one you know hosting the show with whoever will be having in the studio but thank you for giving us your time thank you for staying with us on the coffee break on house of talent television i know you must have had amon saying uh, the statement a certain dialogue well, that certain Diallo is the one who makes us look good on the cameras. He's the one who does everything in the studio. And we'd like to say thank you to him. Uh, thank you to Isma, who's there also on the switcher, you know, making sure that, you know, he shows you one side and the other side also. And basically, they're the guys who make things work here. And to the whole crew, basically, uh, we just want to say thank you to you guys. Remember, you can always comment. Uh, we are live on Facebook, on YouTube, and on our Twitter, HTV1. Uh, make sure to comment, like, let us know if you have any questions. But until next time, have a great day. Grab a cup of Ugandan coffee. Mm. Not other coffee, Ugandan coffee. We'll see you next time.
my first advice to my students mm-hmm. eh, the people I train the people I talk to mm-hmm. is that at every stage of coffee from the farm to the cow yeah. eh, you can gain something mm-hmm. so I first get to know like you as you what's your passion mm-hmm. is it going to the garden is it, go- is it going to the factory mm-hmm. yeah. or is it like being a supplier First of all we are working for people. Yeah. We are working for people. Yeah. But our dreams are being self-employed. Yes. So, in coffee if I'm mentoring you, if like I want you to get something good, yeah, improve on your life. Yeah. Yeah. Me I can pass through roasting. I can teach you how like I can teach you or train you the part of coffee roasting. Mm. So within that process within that process 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 yeah, you like will be making some money somewhere yeah. yeah and where does that money comes from you buy your coffee you roast you pack it and you so, sell yeah. of course there are many cafes that are opening mm-hmm. mm. you have our organizations here in Uganda like they are boosting up the consumption mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. we have business people that are starting up cafes eh? yeah. but there is that gap mm? there is that gap of supply yeah. eh? there is that gap of supply big companies are exporting yeah. eh? but we can also be the big company at our youth stage mm. Mm? we roast our coffee we pack it and sell it. we sell it yeah. mm? Let me take another example. You can be a, a good person in computer graphic designing. Mm. Yeah. So, when I introduce that idea, yeah, like when I introduce that idea, you can plan the way of brand like of branding that coffee. Mm. Yeah. How we can market that coffee. Yeah. Yes. So, we can like af- at the end of the process, mm, me and you will be having something to put in in the pocket yeah. Yeah, or to save <laughs> the account <laughs>
all the, the days that I went to court, honestly speaking, the judge and the lawyers were making submissions. I was writing poems. So at the end of the week, I, I, I had to be honest to myself. Yeah. And this, this, this was a question I, I asked myself. Yeah. But Peter, yeah. what do you really want to do with your life? Yeah. You are at a law firm, but you are writing poems more than actually attending to the legal work. So why don't you? Why are you cheating yourself? So why don't you focus on this thing that you're calling your passion? Try to nurture it and stop living a fake life because you're pretending to enjoy this lawyering thing, but you are not. Yeah. So I went and I talked to my... At the time, I was still at LDC. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd graduated. With, I, had, I had a bachelor's in law yeah. and I was uh, studying to get my practicing certificate. Yeah. And I was remain, we were in term three. Yeah. And so... But the time, uh, but I was doing, I was, I was doing some practice, yeah. some paralegal work, and I told to my, I said to myself, I am, I'm not just cheating myself, but I'm also cheating my parents. They had given me tuition to pay, yes. but I made sure, I wait for my father to come back home, and my mother was already at home, so I went and I told them, I am done, I am tired, and oh, I didn't eat your school fees. Here is the money. Here is the cash. Yes. I want to be a writer please allow me to drop out of, out, out of LDC and pursue this thing. And my father asked me the same question and they were not happy, that to be honest. You could see. I, I could see. But then they could also understand that I wanted to do something that I wanted. So my father asked me the question, what are you going to do now? My answer to him was, what am I not going to do? And for me, because for me, I saw it as an opportunity to explore every else, every other thing I always wanted to do with my poetry. So be it to taking it to studio, uh, be it taking it to theaters around the world, be it publishing it in books. Yeah. I, I felt this, I needed the time to grow. I needed the time to unlearn. I needed the time, I needed the time to practice my craft. And so they were never, they were, they were not happy, but they were supportive. And, and, and I, I mean, I've, there are days I've, I've gone home and I found my mother praying for my book, you know, dedicating it to, and you walk in the house and she <laughs> say, dear God, make my son a successful yes, writer. Yes, yes, so, wow. I, 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 so I, wow. I recognize those efforts yes. uh, that, that my parents, uh, and the pains that they had to go through to, to allow me to become the thing that I wanted, I wanted to, to be. be. A wise man once said, the future has a name and its name is hope. A tiny flicker of light that feeds on hope is enough to shatter any shield of darkness. At Mandulus, we really believe in this. We're a clean energy company that also focuses on agricultural value addition to help improve the lives of farmers in rural Africa. Something that's close to my heart having grown up in these communities. I was born in northern Uganda in such communities that we've seen today. I spent my early childhood running around these, these, these roads. You know, I've lived this, but so has almost every other Ugandan. Because 80% of us are linked to the ground through farming. And now what today has been, been about is figuring out how farming 
can not only be productive for food, but rather how farming can be productive for the entire ecosystem and the economy. How crops once grown can have residues that can be turned into energy to process those same crops, can be turned into energy to cook those same crops, and can be turned into that flicker of light that can shatter any shield of darkness, economically, developmentally and otherwise. I am Jean-Baptiste Fauvel. Uh, I work as a program manager at the EU delegation to Uganda and I'm in charge of uh, working on inclusive green economy. Um, inclusive green economy is one of two focal sectors of the EU's development cooperation with Uganda. So we have allocated a significant amount of resources to advancing this agenda of uh, promoting inclusive green economy in line with the government's ambitions uh, in this regard because uh, Ugandan authorities have launched the Ugandan Green Growth Development Strategy end of 2017 and we are keen on supporting this. This uh, visit to, to the pilot projects implemented by Mandulis in uh, the Gulu district uh, Gulu region is, has been a very interesting experience for me, a learning experience because I'm not familiar with gasification, the gasification of biomass and, and the many uh, interesting uh, technologies implemented by Mandulis here. So I've learned a lot and I am extremely grateful to Peter and his colleagues for uh, showing this and, and uh, the very inspiring message conveyed to, to us visitors. What's interesting about this project, what I've learned from Mandulis, is, is that they are covering the missing link in rural electrification. And that missing link is that, you know, we try to electri electrify people and it always requires subsidy. What they're bringing in is, is they're connecting they're connecting the value chains, the agricultural value chains, the, the groundnuts, the, the rice, the maize, the, um, and, and, and these value chains which are worth a lot of money. They're using, the, they're using the waste from these value chains to make energy which returns resources to the community. And this has not been done successfully in East Africa yet. So this is a really exciting project. And so what, what my plan and what I'll be working on is to try and help them finalize the business so that it's, that it's investable in a, in a way that they can grow to meet all 16 of the target areas. I'm telling you that take this stove, okay, take this shigiri, go home after you've made your muchomo and you've eaten and you've enjoyed yourself, I'll buy back the ash from you. That is crazy, but it's, it's what makes you now say, okay, maybe I should switch because if I calculate the amount of money, let's assume you're, you're buying one ton a year and that one ton you're spending about 500,000 shillings and let's say you're getting about um, a quarter of a ton at the end of the year, 250 grams, uh, 250 kilos, that's uh, five bags of charcoal. How much is five bags of charcoal? You're like, okay. So if you're spending <laughs> 500,000 and you're earning 100,000 from your waste at the end of the year, in a rural environment that's covering, you know, two terms of school for one kid. So it, 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 it gives that incentive to switch uh, because you're saying, look, it's still wood, it's still wood, but this is cleaner. It doesn't beat the environment, it's cheaper, but more importantly, it is an income stream for, for you as a family. Uh, I have been very impressed by what I've seen. Uh, it's been very inspiring and uh, I will be very keen on exploring whether and how we could maybe support uh, Mandulis' ambitions in the future. I will share my takes with colleagues in Kampala and we will explore what can be done. The EU has been a strong partner of Uganda in many different fields, from infrastructure, to development to others and it I feel it's crucial for them to see how what we're doing fits in within their plans and Uganda's plans.
The farmers are ready. The farmers are ready for someone to come in and, and, and make this happen. So we, we go back to what we need is rural electrification, what we need is um, we, need, we need markets for food crops. The, the markets for food crops are there and the opportunities for rural electrification are there and the farmers are willing to participate. So what, what surprised me, it didn't surprise me, but is how knowledgeable they are. Um, Mandulis, I think, has, has raised the awareness, but they're ready to participate and they understand that they have a role to play in, 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 this, in, this, uh, in this great um, activity. And I'm impressed as well at the potential of this region in terms of agriculture and agro-processing. Just have a look at what's around uh, the landscape. You can see how fertile this land is and how much potential there is for such initiatives as those uh, promoted by, by Mandulis. So I am confident that there is a big potential for, for agro-processing industries in the future and of course the gasification of bio-waste bio is, is one of them. This is a, this is a, this is a beautiful area, this is a wealthy area. Um, you know, when, when I heard about Gulu, I had no idea. I, 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 I kind of thought northern Uganda was very dry and uh, I, I, I didn't really know what to expect. And so when I got here, what I've seen is a, a very rich area, a um, lot of crops, a lot of farmers, um, a lot of young people looking for uh, to, to, things to do. And so, I, and and uh, I think that the um, the 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 the, uh, the agricultural value is here. So, what surprised me is the the amount of, of agricultural activity and the potential here. It was fantastic. Uh, I was very much impressed by how welcoming and and friendly uh, the local communities are, especially here in Paminolango. Uh, we were treated with a fantastic um, singing and dancing show, which I will keep in my mind for a long time. I think it was fantastic. And uh, I'm very grateful to all those people, all those communities here for their fantastic welcome. <laughs> I have not had um, sorghum ugali like that for a really long time. I mean, in Nairobi we get maize ugali, but sorghum ugali and the the, uh, the local food here is, is just is just fantastic. I'll also talk about the music. I haven't that was that was like the best village uh, orchestra that I've seen in a long time. So so the food and the music that was that that was like a, a cherry on top of the um, of of the experience. And, and so I, I'm really I'm really looking forward to working on this project. We wanted our guests to experience the warm welcome of the culture in rural Uganda, especially in this part of rural Uganda. So we had everything from Malakwang to Bo to Lakorokoro, you know, to Odi to Olel, all the food that's grown just down the road from here. And they've eaten it right here everything you know even those who had the chicken the chickens are grown here and they've they've been fed on the maize bran and rice bran you know and and everything's from around the corner fresh food natural food cooked with a lot of care and a lot of love for everyone and a lot of welcoming warmth <laughs>
My name is Martin Anthony Nsuvuga. I'm the CEO of Uganda Retirement Benefit Social Authority. And I've served the institution until now. We have grown to the position of the Chief Executive Officer. So I've seen Ubra since its establishment. Um, I was also uh, the person who started the organization as interim CEO uh, for the organization. Um, my role was uh, to set up the organization and, uh, and here we are. It has been a really new experience in my life. As um, you may have heard, Ubra was non-existence. There was no formal regulatory environment for pensions or retirement benefits. So we are a pioneer. We were appointed to set up the architecture and the environment for regulation of retirement benefits and uh, pensions. So the Ministry of Finance, uh, because I was the technical person really handling uh, all these reforms, they asked me to come and set up this institution, which is the Retirement Benefits Regulatory Authority. So I was uh, requested to start as an uh, interim uh, chief executive officer, uh, which I did from the year 2012. Um, to early 2015. It's been a great journey. When we started, we started from scratch. The journey of 10 years of Ubra started with an act of parliament of 2011, but actual operation started in 2012, and that's why we are celebrating 10 years today. There was no institutional setup, there were no laws, uh, there was nothing. So we started with the legal framework, uh, putting in place the legal framework, that uh, establishes uh, the supervisor or the regulator for the retirement benefit sector. Before then, Ubra came into the bucket about 10 years ago. The first thing they did, right from their first offices at Communication House, was to take stock of the market. Who are the players? Who are the retirement players in the market? Who are the service providers? Which schemes are operating in the market? Service to note that there was already something happening in the market, even before Ubra came to play. And because of that, there were Ponzi schemes, there were frauds and all those kind of things. There was no trust uh, in the sector. So our primary objective was to build a system that would do, uh, instill confidence in the general public. I believe the journey has been very successful. We have a footprint now in the community, um, and that footprint is best exemplified by the growth of the pensions sector. As uh, when we were appointed, uh, the pension sector savings were less than, less than five trillion. Today they're approaching 20 trillion. A number of proposals were carried uh, to parliament and the biggest one was to actually put in place a sector regulator my role as a member of parliament when I came in 2001 was to make legislation. And one of the laws we have made is the Ubra Act, which basically came in to assist how to regulate the retirement pension funds, which were missing in this country. I'm proud that now we have over 19 trillion shillings in the pension fund. That's a very good contributor to national development. And in the future, I'm sure, this money we shall not go to borrow. We shall use this money of the pension fund to really develop our country. You would appreciate that uh, this is not a small contribution uh, for a sector that was not regulated. Uh, but overall, it was part of the global reforms that we are seeing in other countries uh, in the pension sector. To me, that's a, a plus for the authority. And we can imagine in a very short time, in less than 10 years, we have over 19 trillion. It believes that within the next five years, we should be over 40 trillion. To me, that is a plus for, for Ubra and a, a surety for the people of Uganda who save with these different schemes, knowing that somebody is there making sure that my money that I put in any scheme is safe, is protected. So one of the main objectives was to safeguard the interests of the members. Now, what this means is that the moment members' interests are safeguarded, their rights are protected, it then boils down to growth of the sector. 
Now, what we've seen in the last 10 years is that the sector, the, the assets under management have more than tripled. So within a span of 10 years, we're seeing a lot of efficiency in terms of members are able to get their benefits, they're able to access more information about their schemes. More importantly is the professionalism that has been injected in the sector. There has been a deliberate effort to build trust because the foundation is strong, it can be trusted, and again, the investment structures are very solid, so which means they encourage the growth of the market, the growth of the portfolio, and also provide the positive returns that we see to date. The last one that is significant, which I've seen Umbra doing, is promoting transparency. So to a member, that information creates trust within the member because you are saying there's nothing I'm hiding. This is how we run the scheme in the year. There were 13 meetings and uh, this member of the board out of 13, he attended three. In the saving schemes, there was no trust. There was no confidence. There was a lot of risk. Even the savers could not know how much their contribution is where. Okay? In other words, everything was in a disarray without any regulator. I think as well, um, looking generally at the business environment, um, you rarely now see complaints of people stating that the funds that they thought they had in their names have disappeared or have been paid to the wrong person. And all this is just because of the supervisory role that Ubra has brought in, which has been pivotal in making us run a world-class pension sector in Uganda. There are three parts to any pension system. There's the contributions or collections of pensions, there is the management of the pensions or the investment of these pension savings, and then there's a the payment of these pension savings, either through a lump sum or through monthly payments. We have had a shared responsibility with Ubra for the past 10 years in the aspect of management of the savings through investments uh, because many of the fund managers whom we license are also licensed by Ubra. Although Ubra focuses a lot more on the pensions or retirement savings that they uh, manage. So we have done this role together, we have had this shared role. The synergies we have drawn from this partnership have been very beneficial and we look forward to continuing to work together with uh, Ubra in the future. We see growth in number of schemes in this market. Today we are talking of 65 schemes. In the past we are talking of three uh, schemes that were established by an act of parliament. That is the public service pension scheme, the parliamentary pension scheme and the NSSF. All of them established by an act of parliament. More importantly is to say that the journey that Ubra has walked over the 10 years have been challenging but also refreshing in a sense that they came into a virgin market. There was no regulator before them, especially in the pension sector. So what they started with was commendable. Let's do a stock taking. Let's understand the market. Who is doing what in the market? So I think that phase helped Ubra create their visibility, create their identity for the first three, four years. Over the years, they've also been able to do publicity to kind of show the market, show the public that this is what we do, and especially as you plan for your retirement. At least for the last 10 years, we've not had any corruption, loss of members' funds. We've also not had any poor investments because investments are all known, structured, in particular known asset classes that provide a very good return to the member. And actually in this period in time, that's when the sector has witnessed high returns to the members, double-digit returns for the last five years or thereabout. So, in my opinion, that is trust from the general public that we are doing the right thing and we hope that we continue to do that. In the next 10 years, what I would like to really see going forward is the spread of coverage. Because the pension sector as it is now is really in the formal sector. And when you look at the working population of Uganda, if you even put it at around 20 to 25 million, the working population, not even 3 million, are covered by pensions. I think my main message to you, Bray, is first of all to thank uh, the CEO, Mr. Martin Nsubuga, and his team for supporting the pension reforms that have taken place so far, but also to remind the team that there's still some work to be done. 
Uh, it's not over, there's still some reforms that need to be done, particularly in the area of limiting access to long-term savings. So Martin and team, please don't rest. There's still some more work to be done to grow the domestic savings base of this country. We feel that as a committee, UBRA needs to make itself more visible in, in Uganda, place itself, let the people of Uganda know what they are doing, let the people of Uganda know why they should save for retirement. If you were to ask me what should UBRA's next 10 years focus on, I would say that UBRA's next 10 years should be to now build this 20 trillion asset base that um, has been generated should actually be able to ensure a comfortable life in retirement for all members who are in the retirement schemes. But UBRA should also then allow and come up with mechanisms to support the players to be able to onboard all the smallholders, all the informal sector to come in and secure their retirement by participating and joining the licensed pension schemes in the market. And so my thinking is that we need to support the institution, particularly Parliament of the Republic of Uganda, needs to support resource mobilization for allocation to the authority so that the authority can continue with the widening the coverage. People now, instead of keeping money in boxes, will keep here and it is in the financial sector and it's easy to tap in. And the cost of money will go down, but our investment in the country will go high. And I can tell you, if you make very good regulations, we will have the support of Parliament. I believe that the next 10 years are quite pivotal. We've gone through uh, the best building of the industry. And right now we are at the point where we have to be tasked with generating value for our clients and exhibiting relevance over the next 10 years. I'm very, very confident. In fact, I'm, I'm really proud of, of the work that has been done for the last 10 years. And my imagination runs wild. Uh, what, what is possible for the next 10 years. And um, the other key achievement that, uh, or work in progress that UBRA is trying to do, which I again encourage different stakeholders in this sector, particularly parliament, to support UBRA, is the, the coming up of, with a national micro-pension scheme. Uganda is, um, our economy is largely informal, and even within the cities, we have so many people who are operating informally and yet they earn income either daily either weekly or monthly they earn income in one way or the other but if not well guided and i think this particular scheme the micro pension scheme would again help reorganize our people in the formal sector to put something aside because if you are in our market today if you're a road vendor today if you're a hawker today if you're a border border today, if you're a fisherman today, you still have that energy to go nearly every day in the waters and do fishing, to go to Nakawa market every morning to pick tomatoes, vegetables. But that strength with time, with time, as years come by, begins to dwindle. That means the same basket that you can carry now, you are not able to carry in the next five years or ten. So our focus, what really keeps us awake? When I wake up in the morning, that drives my day, protection of members' funds. So what I see going forward for the next 10 years is an organization that is efficient, that is creating value for the benefits. Efficiency meaning when I contribute, I must be guaranteed that 20 years from now, 30 years from now, when I retire, my money will be there. And, and ensuring that the monies that I contribute uh, invested in assets that will make my money grow. Not just putting in one shilling, and 20 years you're paid one shilling. When I put in one shilling, I should be paid 100 shillings at the end of 30 years. And that's the objective, and that's efficiency. I think to the customer out there, um, who might not even think they are a customer because you ride a border border, you are in the garden, you, you, you don't even have anything to your name, Ubra will find you wherever you are and will look after you because it's their mandate to look after you in retirement. And they can only look after you in retirement if you avail yourself now. And all they want to do for you is to make sure that when you hang up your boots, when I hang up this jacket in retirement, Ubra wants me to live a fulfilled life, a life bereft of poverty, a life of joy and happiness. 
and Ubra works with people and different entities to deliver that. As service providers, I think we'd want to say um, congratulations again, Ubra. Um, we feel the heat sometimes, but we are ready for the task. As we celebrate, let's also remember that there are those who are not yet part of the saving culture and we find ways of bringing them forward. I wish you a happy celebration. As we celebrate 10 years of service protecting retirement benefits in this country, allow me to thank the Board of Directors of Uganda Retirement Benefits Regulatory Authority. They have been very instrumental and very focused. Allow me also to thank the staff and management of UBRA. We have supported the cause. Allow me also to thank my predecessors, the first interim CEO, Mr. Moses Bekavio, the chief executive officer, my immediate predecessor, uh, Mr. Bonyi David Nyekondi, the government of Uganda who have supported us, providing us with all the resources that we need from the day UBRA started up to now, the regulated entities, the stakeholders, the fund managers, the custodians, the administrators. Without you, we would not be talking of structures of governance in this market. And of course, the members who are saving, who have trusted us, who have continuously saved with the different schemes. Allow me to assure you that as we deliberate on this direction for the next years of service, at Hubra, we shall continue to protect your retirement benefits. May God bless you. May God bless your families. May God bless our country, Uganda. Let us celebrate as we thank God. It's a CEO bench, so usually people want to assume that all CEOs are overlearned and stuff like that. So I will, I will change the script this time around. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I consider myself a certified hustler. If I'm looking to know who you are, are you Ugandan? If yes, what are the values that define you as Ugandan? <sighs> That's the easiest question, I think, to answer. I am a typical Lao man from a route north yeah. in a place called Ogur, and where I will be laid to rest is in a village called Agweng. So if you go there and you just say Otoa Tony, they won't really know me because my father is also Otoa Tony. <laughs> you have to ask for Junior. And when you're asking, you have to ask with an accent. Yeah. Junior Tikwene. Yeah. Where is Junior? <laughs> and they will, they will identify me. But I am I'm typically yeah. Ugandan, only yeah. Ugandan, yeah. Uh, from Lira. I pride myself from being uh, from Lira. I, earlier on, I, I was joking and saying I'm the coolest lago yeah. south of Karuma. <laughs> when you cross Karuma, there are so many. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, when yeah. you're down the south, south. after Karuma, oh, I think I, I'm number one. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, now that you know, Tony Otoa is Ugandan. And of course, what are the values that define you as a Ugandan? Um, I think it's the love for country, uh, love for nation. You know, truth be told, the country is in a lot of, it's a crisis. Leadership crisis, economic crisis, social crisis. There's so many mismatching areas. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's home. You know, you cannot run and abandon your home because of the issues in your home. I think that then creates an opportunity for you to do something to change what's happening and what you see as a crisis. So in terms of what I see as a, a value, what I take out of that for me, I think is just the, the love for country, the, the need to serve country the best way I can. And I mean, I can't say I, I can change everything, but the little I can do to create a difference, I think is more meaningful for me. Wow. Yeah. Mr. Tony Otoa, growing up, what did you want to be in life? And uh, what was the journey like for Mr. Otoa? <laughs> 
Yeah, you know, my father, my father is crazy. My father would call us and he would show me the compass. The idea was supposed to be a pilot. You know, the planes <laughs> would fly over our house yeah. and uh, my father would be like, yeah, you're going to be a pilot. Yeah. But of course, as you grow, you realize that you have so many things that really define you. I was yeah. never a sportsman. So I enjoyed a lot of debate and, you know, a lot of indoor activities. And that is, I think, what really drove me into some of the things that I do up to today. Uh, public speaking, the love for debates and, 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 and really in a lot of intellectual discourse and all this stuff. But besides that, I think it's also the fact that um, I won't lie. I did not know what I wanted to be. It's a CEO bench, so usually people want to assume okay. that all yeah, CEOs you know. are over learned and stuff like that. So I will, <laughs> I will change the script this time around. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I consider myself a certified hustler. If I'm looking to know who you yeah, are, about the shots? are you Ugandan? If yes, about the shots. What are the values that define you as Ugandan? Did you discuss? Did you discuss That's the, shots? the easiest question I think to answer. I am a typical Lao man from a rooted north in like a place you. called Ogur. And where I will be laid to rest is okay. in a village I'm called Agwe. Go. So I'm if ready. you go there and you just say Otoa Tony, they yeah, won't yeah. really know me because my father is also Otoa Tony. <laughs> you have to ask for Junior. And when you're asking, you have to ask with an accent. Yeah. Junior Tikwe. Yeah. Where is Junior? <laughs> and they will, they will identify me. But I am I'm typically Ugandan, only yeah. Ugandan, yeah. Uh, from Lira. I pride myself from being uh, from Lira. I, earlier on, I, I was joking oh, and saying um, I'm the coolest lago yeah. south of Karuma. <laughs> when you cross Karuma, there are so many. Yeah, yeah, but when yeah, you're yeah. down the south so, after Karuma, oh, I think I, I'm number one. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, now that you know, Tony Otoa is Ugandan. And of course, what are the values that define you as a Ugandan? Um, I think it's the love for country, uh, love for nation. You know, truth be told, the country is in a lot of, it's a crisis. Leadership crisis, economic crisis, social crisis. There's so many mismatching areas. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's home. You know, you cannot run and abandon your home because of the issues in your home. I think that then creates an opportunity for you to do something to change what's happening and what you see as a crisis. So in terms of what I see as a, a value, what I just take out of that. that for me, I think is just the, the love for country, the, the need to serve country yeah, the, the best, best way I can. Yeah. And I mean, I can't say I, I can change everything, but the little I can do to create yeah, a difference, yeah, I think is more meaningful for me. Wow. Yeah. Mr. Tony Otoa, growing up, what did you want to be in life? And uh, what was the journey like for Mr. Otoa? Yeah, you know, my father, my father is crazy. My father would call us and he would show me the compass. The idea was supposed to be a pilot. You know, the planes would fly over our house and uh, my father would be like, yeah, you're going to be a pilot. But of course, as you grow, you realize that you have so many things that really define you. I was never a sportsman. So I enjoyed a lot of debate and, you know, a lot of indoor activities. And that is, I think, what really I drove me see. into some of the things that I do up to today. Uh, public speaking, uh, the love for debates and, 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 and really a lot of intellectual discourse and all this stuff. But besides that, I think it's also the fact that um, I won't lie. I did not know what I wanted to be. Completely disconnected with him. Welcome to the CEO bench, ladies and gentlemen from all across the world. My name is Edio Killer, and of course, the CEO bench exists to bring you the stories of people who are on the top, doing it on the top, leading on the top, people who have been through change management, and of course, are transforming lives, and they have transformed their own personal lives to reach there as well as those who are headed to the top. What are their stories? What have they been through? What can we learn from them? Do they have some really interesting experiences to share with us? Yes, they do. And of course, on the CEO bench this week, this morning, <coughs> or this evening, or this afternoon, depending on which part of the world you are located, 
is the one and only the man who needs no introduction. The African youngest man on planet Earth that is doing great and amazing stuff. Been over to the creative industry, done that, is now thinking for different businesses at different levels. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you my guest this morning, Bedford Buyungo, a.k.a. Professor in the making. Welcome <laughs> to the show. Thank you so much. Great to have you on the show this morning. Thank you so much. How have you been? I'm great. You I'm have great. been overwhelmingly nominated to come back to the CEO bench. Oh, uh, would you like to tell us why would these people overwhelming nominate you by over 30 votes to come back to the CEO bench, yet you have been on the CEO bench before? I wouldn't know, but I appreciate them. They are in a better position to let you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much. Bedford, we want to just go straight to our interview this morning. And of course, I want you to just share with us a few of you know, the things, the journey, and of course, what you have been through and uh, what you're still going through as a person on the top. The CEO bench is a very interesting, you know, place to be. Mm -hmm. We look at things from a different perspective. And I want to just give you a small background to what the CEO bench is about. Mm -hmm. One, we focused on individual people who are leaders and in position of leadership. Yeah. The program, of course, is center focused on discussion about leadership, change management, and transformation, both at individual level and as well as the corporation levels where you are, as well as the community where you live, mm -hmm. and uh, the nation where you lead or where you reside. All of us are leaders in our nations, but people often think that only people who are defined by political boundaries are the ones who are leading. But all of us are leaders at our levels, and it's important that we keep reminding people that even as a border border man on the streets of Kampala or in the streets of any streets of the city anywhere in Africa, you are a leader. Because the things you are doing at that level is leadership. How you change your life from a border border person to becoming a taxi driver, to becoming a bus driver, to becoming a pilot, is what we're calling change management at that level. Mm -hmm. But also, if you're moving from being a creative person at your level to becoming a creative thinker, yeah. to becoming a strategist, to becoming a research and develop person, developer person, and for being that person that think for brands and think for businesses <coughs> and create things, that's change management. True. When we're looking at transformation, we look at the foray of moving from this one space to the next space, to the next space, is key for us going forward. And that is what the CEO bench exists for. And so this morning, I want to ask you this question which I've asked you before. Yeah. If I am looking for a small and fast and quick definition of who Bedford Buyungo is, what would be your definition of who you are? Um, I'm, um, first, I identify as a Pan-Africanist who has passion for research and development. Yeah. And um, yes, I'm an entrepreneur. And I think in there has many things. Mm -hmm. When you talk about Pan-Africanism, it means you're pro-Africa, you're pro-African progress. Mm -hmm. When you talk about research and development, it has an element of research. It has an element of development, mm -hmm. <coughs> developing products or brands or whatever field you're applying R&D. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you talk about entrepreneurship, uh, still it speaks to something. And uh, there is reason why those three things, there is reason for Pan-Africanism, there is reason for R&D, there is reason for entrepreneurship. Yeah. And uh, for me, it is that I, 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 I uh, as a Pan-Africanist, I. I was like, the only way we can progress Africa is probably through the element of economics. So uh, yes, I know other elements work hand in hand, but yes, we've tried politics and people have played us. We've tried all other elements, even donor you know, funding, and we've not gotten to places we've gotten to. So I was like, why don't I get this craft, the R&D craft, 
and uh, be able now to birth products. Uh, we, of course, with my marketing and uh, brand knowledge, to birth um, uh, brands from uh, you know end to end and go compete in the world. Yeah. And uh, I saw that as an opportunity uh, to birth brands and uh, compete on the global stage. Yeah. Like Andrew Garcia says, he said that Africa needs aid, so it needs trade, not aid. Yeah. So when you say Africa needs trade, not aid, it means that you need to put something on the table for the people to buy. There is a lot of things that work for you to be able to sell in the States, for you to be able to sell uh, in Asia, for you to be able. But thank God that uh, every region of the world, God has put something unique. So the avocado that I'm going to sell from Uganda is not uh, the same as the one that someone I'm going to compete with for, uh, from Asia has. So in a nutshell, I've, uh, and I'm reminding people who get confused of who I am, <laughs> that I'm simple a Pan-Africanist yeah. yeah. who has a passion for research and yeah. development and entrepreneurship. Wow. Well, um, you now know more about uh, Bedford Buyungo. He's more of a professor than just a simple man you know. Of course, if all the professors were as simple as him in their making, I think would go far. And of course, uh, the last time he was here, he said that, um, you know, I am a self-proclaimed professor. And of course, uh, you can see from there that it, you don't have to have a definition beyond the boundaries to understand what he has just said and to believe in him. But I would like to welcome you to the CEO bench and I would like to encourage you today to make this program as interactive as possible. Share with us what your comments are and even your kisses and disses. When we say kisses and disses, I mean, tell us we're doing very good. We will be able to take that feedback. And if you think we're not doing very well, Tell us what you would want to see, and the CEO bench is here to make sure that you actually have that information. And now straight to our discussion, um, Bedford, I just want to take you through to a couple of things that people have been talking about. Yeah. You have been the newest CEO on the bench of your company, and by definition of a CEO is not just that you have uh, too many we often believe that to, see, to be at a CEO bench, you need to have many layers of, 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 of system put in place or structures that put in place. And, and I'm saying, yes, that's true. But what about the CEO who still starts the company from scratch, gets it to a certain level, and start to cross the boundaries and moving to continents? Mm -hmm. And when you cross to the continent, you, of course, fully, fully now become the CEO definition we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And you've been doing this from the Saint Africa, we've seen the brand cross the borders and become something of a development. You're working on another brand called the, you know, the Voyage Africa, if I get the name very right. African Voyage. African Voyage, yeah. which is the boat uh, building company. Building company. Mm -hmm. And the thinking is great. Mm -hmm. The motivation is great. We just want to start from there. Where do you draw your motivation to think like this? I, I, I partly tackled that in the first question. Um, there is a, uh, there's something called vision, and I think I talked ab about it last time we were here. Yeah. Uh, once you have a vision, then your picture is about 70% clear. The 30% are leave it to God. Yeah. So when you have a, a clear picture, then uh, the mzungu, or the white man says the end justifies the means. the means. When I want to go to 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 Kampala, and I'm using public means, I I I I, I behave differently from the man who is using public means from Kampala to Masaka. Mm -hmm. One is going far, one is going yeah. near. <clears throat> and uh, by default. Uh, when you when you sit in a taxi and you're going to Ntinda, the uh, normal saying is Mama Sao. Mm -hmm. So you know that uh, it's close, but because you, you're very clear of where you're going, um, your behavior follows yeah, automatically. Yeah. It means I don't need to greet my neighbor because soon it's going to be Mama Sao. The posture cha even changes. Yeah. When I'm, for, for example, at the front seat, 
uh, I'm looking, you know, looking around and uh, soon I say, conductor, Masao. But the guy going to Masaka Okigali using Masaka Road, mm -hmm. by default, the posture is going to change. The first thing you do is, eh, what's your mm -hmm. How are you, my, you know? Because you know anything can happen yeah. <laughs> along the way. So the vision is very important and uh, my vision is uh, deeply linked to where Africa is going. And no one has come out to tell us about uh, where Africa is going. Mm -hmm. The 54 countries have not sat, or, or, or African Union, mm -hmm. and probably made it clear that Africa needs to be this, mm -hmm. Africa needs to be that by this time. Mm -hmm. It might be there, big documents, but not you know, in one statement that yeah. Africa needs to be this. So many of us Pan-Africanists, the doers, the talkers, the many Pan-Africanists, or people who are pro-Africa, um, um, uh, everyone has, uh, you know, their contribution to, to African progress. Now mine is uh, deeply linked to African pro economic, you know, African progress. And uh, since I come from the brand world, marketing world, I, I decided that I will champion the uh, global brands that are coming from Africa. I know many people have gone before me, but uh, mine is to contribute to, to many African brands and see them compete globally. Because I know when the African brands are competing globally, that means jobs, that means many things, and uh, that means good life, good health, many things. Wow. Yeah. Bedford, a lot of the nomination that came this time around uh, to bring you back to the CEO bench, where a number of people who started their companies, from what we, the data we're seeing at the CEO bench here, <coughs> a number of people who started their companies, and uh, just in 2019, some of them had great aspirations. Yeah. They had moved out from their jobs and started something else, and uh, you know they were doing really great, and they had plans, the visions were clear, the missions were clear, and then, the pandemic came from nowhere, yeah. and it is uh, accounted for to have started somewhere in, in China, mm -hmm. and nobody saw it making its way in, uh, in, uh, in January or by December 2019 and January 2020, it arrived here. Yeah. Most of us were expecting it to be here a little bit much later because China is really far away from Africa, yeah. and, but it made its way here quite faster and quicker. Yeah. And uh, a lot of these companies, a lot of these individuals that started these companies, that moved from their former employment to start these companies, are now facing a big challenge of even extinction and, you know, slipping back to employment. Some of them are really running mad. And I'm um, talking about guys who started the company uh, by employing from 10 to 15 to 20. I met one of them yesterday that says um, he employs 45 people from when he started and now he's going to have to cut down everyone because the vision is not going where it's supposed to be. Yeah. Pandemic has happened. Yeah. How do we help such fellows move forward? How have you been able to do it? Because you've been in the same space almost around the same time mm -hmm. is when the Saint Africa comes, True. Or, and you know it rolls out and, and it's working. What are, what would be the best advice to give from one, the background perspective of a marketer, yeah, brand developer, yeah, an advertiser, yeah, and now an entrepreneur, yeah, as well as and uh, you know a Pan Africanist who is thinking from a different perspective altogether, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for that question and uh, for the people who nominated me along those lines. Yeah. Um, it's sad what, uh, what, what is happening and what is going on for, uh, in the world, then Africa and, uh, and um, of course, um, our country. It is sad and uh, no one saw this coming. But uh, even in, the, in what I call such career days, always a blessing. Yeah. So I'll start by encouraging these people to accept that the foundations are shaken. Yeah. You, you did mention around 29 people had started yeah. business. For I think we, we were online in, in, 19, in 2020. Yeah. Saint Africa started selling globally in, in 2020. Yeah. And uh, so the, th the first thing is to accept so acceptance 
really takes you uh, far. Uh, it means it's going to manage your posture. It's going to influence your posture towards uh, issues. And um, I did, uh, when you told me about this, I, I did write something. Probably that's the reason you call me professor. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, uh, yeah. uh, yes, it's an interview, but I, I, I take the opportunity to teach. And uh, I, I'm not a professor that has been awarded a degree. Yeah. And <laughs> it's just a nickname. Yeah. So, um, that, like I said, the first thing, and uh, in, in our viewers, uh, I can even get pen and paper and then we write a few things yes. down yeah. to guide us. So I did write 11 points on how to maneuver. I don't know if that we have the time to, Please. but I'll be fast. Please. And feel free to interject yeah. and uh, we make it interactive, enjoyable and uh, uh, quite uh, something for our viewers. Yes. So like I said, mine was to first accept that uh, the foundations are shaken because now that is going to help you measure you know where the cracks are but if you sail through and uh, like nothing is happening then uh, you have a problem yeah it's like a, a, an ostrich uh, buried their head in the sun yeah. and think the whole body is not being seen but uh, <laughs> uh, you know the, yeah, yeah. the whole of the body is on the other side yeah. so point number two is to, ma uh, to uh, not to make th by not making things worse yeah. is to is to is to act okay to apply action to act and uh, first we say that you accept and then now we are saying you act mm -hmm. Of course, uh, different businesses um, have different challenges. Like you, uh, your friend you talked about has 45 guys. He has to think about <coughs> uh, how to survive the 45 guys, how to lay off the 45 guys. He has different challenges, but it's not just 45. It's yeah. the rent, it's the many things. Yeah. So the thing is to act. Act, if you have a rent, then you need to write to the landlord, yeah. is to act and uh, pick yourself up, be strong. I know uh, where uh, strength is going to come because uh, it's hard to tell someone who's lost even friends mm. and family to be strong. Mm. But uh, we need to be strong for each other. Mm -hmm. And part of why we probably we're even spending this time is to help our friends be strong. Yeah. Is to help them, uh, you know, strengthen their resolve in them, uh, you know, making a way through this uh, pandemic. Yeah. So the point number three that I wrote is dealing with reality, not fiction. Wow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes, yes. So reality, I talked about in the previous uh, point about when you're talking about rent, for example, that's the reality. Yeah. You probably rent an, an office of, um, uh, say, a, a million shillings, yeah. Ghana shillings. Yeah. And uh, yes, you need to deal with that reality. You need to, you, to, to write to your to your, uh, your, your employees, to the landlord. That's the action we talked about. Yeah. But the reality is not dealing with fiction, what people are saying, what you had the other side. You analyze and then you act. Yeah. Wow. Uh, the other day, I think I was seen on social media walking, yes. but I wasn't <laughs> walking for fun. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. I wasn't walking for fun. I had a deal. The business. I had a business in As town. A, yes. And uh, uh, someone was paying some money mm -hmm. for me to do something. And I was like, okay, do you I... Can't drive? I can't drive because I'm not amongst uh, essential, essential workers. And um, uh, I didn't have a bicycle. So I was like, and in Entebbe, I thought about where to buy a bicycle. Probably I thought they would be more expensive. So I'm like, you know what? Uh, I'm going to walk. So I prepared the, uh, that night at fruits, you know, <laughs> did all <laughs> what I thought yeah. would take me through the 42 kilometers yeah. and I walked. So as people are enjoying my walking moment because I shared it on social media, yeah. internally I knew that I'm going to, to finish something. Yeah. Yeah. So that way, I managed to walk and uh, get to Kampala after yes. four and a half hours yes. and uh, I was able to 
only to you know um, uh, uh, meet my client yes. and then go through. So it idea. was actually working for you to go to do business. To do business. Yeah. Now I, I just want to just hold it right there, and I want to interject from that point. Many of us, when we become CEOs, mm -hmm. or by CEOs, I mean chief executive officer. It means that um, there are a smaller other executive people under you here yeah. that runs probably finance, uh, human resource, uh, you know, administration, that runs marketing here. Yes. But you are now the chief because you are now looking at things from a you know, visionary point of view, directional yeah. point of view, and, you know, finding the pathways yeah. for us to get there and, and solving the problem yeah. that the team here are not. So one of them is to get business yeah. and to connect business yeah. to them. Then they can do the business. That's yeah. the CEO we're looking for. Definitely. Yeah, so at that level, mm -hmm. and we learned this from a business development manager called uh, Dr. Uh, Jean Paul Olo. Yes. Talked about it on the show here. And we learned something from there that at that level you're focusing on strategic partnerships True. and direction. Yes. Now many CEOs at that level uh -huh. can't sit on border borders. Yes. Don't want to walk on the road. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they can't move and there's no vehicle, yeah. they're always driven. Yeah. But yet we saw you here with Saint Africa. I don't know whether Ugandans and many Ugandans and many Africans actually understand or been to that website to see mm -hmm. what Saint Africa is really putting out there. Mm -hmm. But when we see you walking from there, forty-two kilometers to Kampala, and we're enjoying the walk, mm -hmm. and you are coming to meet another CEO who yes. is giving you business. Yeah. And when I learned of the business volume that you are picking from this CEO and going. Mm -hmm. It was such a very, you know, I would say, mind-boggling situation. Yeah. To see how when we rise to a certain level, we can't come down. Yeah. What informed your decision to do that? It's still, I was looking at the business and I'm like, I, of course, I can't send anyone. Uh, they are also in lockdown. They are also in lockdown, but uh, also I was meeting the CEO. Mm. So he needed to be at that level. So he's like, are you able to make it? And I'm like, yes, I'm able to make it. I didn't tell him how. So I started working. And, uh, and uh, uh, for me, it was what I'm winning for, for, the, for, the, for, for the rest of the company. And yeah. of course, when I win that, I win it on behalf of the rest. Uh, the rest. So it is always on behalf of the rest, I'll go the extra mile. Yeah. Yes. Wow. We want to take a break, uh, Bedford, and when we come back, you'll pick it up from point number four, which is the reality. We are learning from the CEO and as well as the business proprietor, the founder, and you nominated him to come to the show. He has 11 points so far, three knocked down, and I think that uh, one, think about it, if I'm not mistaken. Number two, you know, take action. Number three, look at the reality. All right, we'll be right back after the break. Fitness Junction would love to thank you for your continued support and patience during these trying times. With the ongoing pandemic, we have come up with different standards of operation that can keep you safe and keep us safe. Come have a quick tour with me.
it's a CEO bench, so usually people want to assume that all CEOs are over learned and stuff like that. So I will <laughs> I will change the script this time round. Uh, yeah, yeah. uh, I, I consider myself a certified hustler. If I'm looking to know who you are, are you Ugandan? If yes, what are the values that define you as Ugandan? <sighs> That's the easiest question I think to answer. I am a typical Lao man from a route north yeah. in a place called Ogur. And where I will be laid to rest is in a village called Agueng. Yeah. So if you go there and you just say Otoa Tony, they won't really know me because my father is also Otoa Tony. <laughs> you have to ask for Junior. And when you're asking, you have to ask with an accent. Yeah. Junior Tikwene. Yeah. Where is Junior? <laughs> and they will, they will identify me. But I am I'm typically yeah. Ugandan, only yeah. Ugandan, yeah. Uh, from Lira. I pride myself from being uh, from Lira. I, earlier on, I, I was joking and saying I'm the coolest Lago yeah, yeah. south of Karuma. <laughs> when you cross Karuma, there are so many. Yeah, yeah, but when yeah. you're down the south so, after Karuma, oh, I think I, I'm number one. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, now that you know, Tony Otoa is Ugandan. And of course, what are the values that define you as a Ugandan? Um, I think it's the love for country, uh, love for nation. You know, truth be told, the country is in a lot of, it's a crisis. Leadership crisis, economic crisis, social crisis. There's so many mismatching areas. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's home. You know, you cannot run and abandon your home because of the issues in your home. I think that then creates an opportunity for you to do something to change what's happening and what you see as a crisis. So in terms of what I see as a, a value, what I take out of that for me, I think is just the, the love for country, the, the need to serve country the best way I can. And I mean, I can't say I, I can change everything, but the little I can do to create a difference, I think is more meaningful for me. Wow. Yeah. Mr. Tony Otoa, growing up. <laughs> moment mm. are, are struggling to understand the older generation because mm. times have changed technology has come in. they've moved on yes we're the ones sitting back and wondering what is my child on to TikTok has surpassed what's yap mm -hmm. the other one i call uh, I, I never call it facebook it's book face <laughs> why are you on book face <laughs> dad it's facebook yes Me, I keep saying, yeah. I have a foot amongst the millennials. Yeah. And I understand the traditionalists. Okay. There's a song in the 60s, by the way, and yeah. then in the 90s, 70s, where they're like, parents don't understand. Yes. Ah, remember Prince? Yes. Prince. Yes. Remember Prince? Yes. It is the CEO bench. My name is Eddie Okela. Welcome to the next session and season of the CEO bench right out of Kampala to the rest of the world. It's a 45 minutes of a bumpy ride with the CEOs, those who are on the top, those who are rising to the top, and those who are coming down from the top. What is it like to be a CEO? What is it like to lead yourself to a certain degree of respect in our society today. Today on the program, my guest is a man who has been around for a long time. The man who speaks and breathes marketing. In fact, it is believed that marketing was injected in him from birth. Ladies and gentlemen, with no further ado, is Mr. William Colombo. Colombo is a fellow of Nairobi University and a marketer by profession. He is also the convener of the famous Marketers' Night Out in East Africa. He is the great publisher of the marketing publication magazine across 